بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد So we're going to talk about the Mongols today and what are the Mongols influence on Islamic history which of course is a major major influence um, you have this transition from the Mamluk times to what's often called the gunpowder empires or the Ottomans Safavids and Mughals and all of them have a direct relation to the Mongol invasion that happened before them and this is the 10th lecture in our series so the class is wrapping up and I hope you're all having a good time working on your final papers and if you ever need any help or assistance with your final papers please please feel free to reach out to me Ahlan wa sahlan assalamu alaykum ya tullab al -aum. So, we've already talked a little bit about the Mongols and how they were fighting against the Mamluks. And for instance, we've talked about Hulagu already, but uh, in this lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Temur and Ulugbe and Sultan Hussein Baykara. And um, I just kind of have some images here to show you a little bit uh, about Mongol culture. Um, they were known for their compound bow, which is a type of bow that was unknown to the Arab world. It could shoot with much more ferocious power, and the Mongols were known for being able to shoot very accurately while on horseback. Um, and, you know, the, the Turkic predecessors, such as the Seljuks and Mamluks and whatnot, um, were known for this as well, uh, you know, horseback on, uh, archery on horseback, but they did not have the composite bull that the, the Mongols had, so that was a big uh, factor in, you know, having this new military technology was a big factor in them being able to conquer as much land as they could. And eventually they would convert to Islam in the Middle East. You see uh, a mosque tent, a tent that served as a masjid, but it's built like a Mongolian yurt. So they had mosque tents and eventually became quite uh, Islamicized, if you will, converted to Islam and all of that. So we're going to talk about it. And so the word Mongol is attested to in the 8th century current era in Tang Dynasty records. And in the 13th century, you know, it becomes this word that is an umbrella term for a large grouping of Mongolic and Turkic tribes united under Genghis Khan. And so that's why the word Khan is such a popular name now in the Muslim world. It goes back to Genghis. And Mongolic languages are of an unclear origin. The modern linguists know that they're related to Turkic languages somehow. Exactly how is debated. And um, it might be a Paleo-Siberian language which is just a way of saying it's a very ancient language that might not have any other living relatives um, of kind of more the Siberian region some even so say uh, paleo uh, Sinian I think it, it's called to say an ancient Chinese language um, but they, they could they consider it a, some linguists not all of them like I said it's, it's hotly debated but a good chunk of linguists consider that Turkic and Mongolic languages belong to a larger language family called Altaic from the Altaic Mountains in Mongolia and um, some of them consider Korean and Japanese to be you know part of this larger language family which is all shown in the map up there you know all the blue the red the green yellow purple is all Altaic languages um, but some linguists dispute this and try to refute it however you know there are still linguists that hold this opinion and they published this famous book 
etymological dictionary of the Altaic languages with Brill, which is considered the most prestigious of all academic publishers. So this is something that does have ground in academia. And I'm saying all that because I notice on Wikipedia pages, they try to portray um, this linguistic theory as something that's false or been refuted when that, that is not the case. It's still hotly debated. And in Europe, uh, they called Mongols or the Golden Horde as Tartars, Tartarus meaning hell in Latin. Um, so it's just kind of their way of giving them a disparaging term. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the background of the word Mongol. And then if you've ever watched that show, Ertuğrul, um, it begins with these sort of Turkish nomadic uh, tribes leaving in mass Central Asia and migrating towards Anatolia, what's now modern day Turkey. Um, Turkic peoples are thought to have originated in those Altai mountains, Altaic mountains that I had mentioned that, you know, from Mongolia. Um, and they migrated from there to Central Asia, where they had displaced the Iranic um, inhabitants who are believed to be the original human inhabitants of Central Asia. Um, you know, the Caucasus Mountains, which is like where Chechnya and Dagestan and all that's located, is where they believe the Indo-European languages start. One branch broke off and went down through Central Asia, populated Iran and Northern India. Another branch broke off and went and settled into Europe. And so that's why to this day, Ur Urdu and Farsi have a lot of the same words and similar uh, culture to them. You know, you have like Dost, um, Dil, Biar, like all these words that are in common between the two languages, Chor for thief and things like that you'll find in both Urdu and, and Farsi. Um, so it's, there's a, a common history there. And then the Turks kind of displaced the Iranic speaking peoples of, of Central Asia. And that's why all throughout history, starting from the very ancient times until the medieval times, the Turkic people usually had some bilingual fluency with Iranic languages, whether it be Sogdian or, you know, Pahlavi or what have you. Um, and so there's always been this very strong relationship between the Turks uh, and Persianate culture. And we will see that same dynamic going on with the Mongols as well. And so after, you know, the Turks had displaced the Iranic peoples of Central Asia, they remained there for some centuries and then the Mongol um, expansion with Genghis Khan had displaced the Turks of Central Asia and they went and settled in Anatolia, displacing the Greek speaking peoples of Anatolia who've lived there since Alexander the Great. And before that, um, you had the Hittites, um, Phrygians, and Luvians that have uh, been living in that area. The Hittites um, spoke an Indo-European language, like they use the word Wasser for water, which is the exact same word in German, Wasser, things like that. They, I think they use something like Brot for bread. So, I mean, it, it was clearly an Indo-European Indo language that was written in cuneiform, the Hittites. Um, University of Chicago is, is the top school that does research on the Hittite language, and they have this famous Hittite uh, dictionary. The Hittites fought against the Assyrians, the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Persians, like it was one of the big ancient Near Eastern empires. Alexander the Great then conquered them and everything became Hellenized and very Greek and Anatolia had been populated with Greek speaking peoples. Some of the Seljuks managed to take territory in Anatolia, but they ruled over a Greek speaking population. Then when the Oghuz Turks um, came from Central Asia to Anatolia, they further displaced Greek speaking people there. Although even now in modern day Turkey, there are uh, sections of Turkey that uh, just speak Greek. They're, they're Muslim, 
but they speak Greek. So that's still a, a remnant of uh, the Hellenistic, I guess you could say, history of Anatolia before the Turks arrived there. Now the infamous Ilkhanids and Timurids. So I use uh, infamous because they they kind of you know in in the historical sources they have this such a uh, almost horrific or kind of uh, dark and macabre like uh, presentation um, because they've killed so many peoples and they you know followed the Mongolian tradition of just decimating entire populations um, and so they kind of get this uh, very morbid depiction in the historical sources and we talked a little bit about the Ilkhanids in the last lecture so I'm not going to get into the origins of the Ilkhanids too much but basically uh, they had a ruler Ghazan who converted to Islam in 12 95 and in the 1330s the Ilkhanate was ravaged by the Black Death the plague Ta'un and its last Khan Abu Sa'id died in 1335 and then it, the whole you know Ilkhanate uh, Khanate disintegrated and they tried to portray themselves as um, the inheritors of the Sasanid Empire in a way, even though they were Mongolian and Turkic by descent. Um, and so they did this to kind of give themselves authority. So you have different books that are written, you know, that kind of portray them as these great Persian kings, even though they were outsiders. And so Hulagu's descendants ruled Persia for the next 80 years, and they tolerated different religions like shamanism from the Turks, Buddhism and Christianity. Buddhism used to be quite big in Uzbekistan and Afghanistan, um, and Buddhism was the dominant religion among the Mongols. They also had shamanism too, like the Turks, so all these kind of religions were tolerated, but Islam was adopted as the state religion. Um, so they became, you know, like a Muslim state officially declaring themselves as such. And then came a new group of people who called themselves the Kurigan, and they were uh, known as the Timurids, founded by a Turco-Mongolian man who ruled from 1370 until his death in 1405. And that is Tamerlane, as he's known to the West or Temur Kurigan, and he founded the Timurid Empire and what's now modern-day Afghanistan, Iran, and Central Asia. And so he was the first ruler of the Timurid dynasty as it's known to the West. And he was an undefeated commander and widely regarded as one of the greatest military leaders and tacticians in all of human history. And he was known for his brutality. And um, the picture here is a facial reconstruction of Temur from his skull. So that probably is quite accurately what he looked like. And he envisioned himself as the great restorer of the Mongol Empire of Genghis Khan. And he regarded himself as Genghis's heir. Temur continued vigorous trade relations with Ming China and the Golden Horde. And Golden Horde at this point being north um, of Central Asia, kind of around the Caucasus area and in Russia. And um, it led to this, what's known as the Timurid Renaissance. Um, and you had two Timurid Renaissances as they're known, where um, there was a great uh, patron of uh, the arts, of science, literature, Islamic studies, all of that type of stuff that we might call as the humanities and STEM nowadays. Um, there was a great, great uh, proliferation and uh, patronization of knowledge where uh, tons and tons of money were flowing into research during that time. 
And so Ulul Bey was one of the Timurids who was himself a scholar of astronomy, mathematics, tri trigonometry, and all that. And he was known to be multilingual, speaking Arabic, Persian, uh, whatever form of Turkish during that day, Mongolian, and uh, Chinese. And his reign is considered the cultural peak of the Timurid Renaissance. And um, he ruled over Samarkand, which has always been this uh, center of intellectual production. And uh, he built the great Uluq Bey Observatory in Samarkand. And it was considered to be the best, one of the best observatories in the entire world, but especially the Islamic world. So he was really into Nijama or uh, astronomy, astrology. And this is uh, the whole Muslim world kind of around this time starts to get into astronomy. Um, get a more refined understanding of the stars, the planets, the moon, and it also refined um, the precision of the Islamic calendar. They were able to start calculating prayer times and things like that based on astronomy. So it was a shift in how um, you could say time was understood in the Islamic world, which had all kinds of implications for fiqh how prayer times got calculated, how the beginning or end of Ramadan got calculated, Nifs al-Sha'ban, and all those types of things. And so he was really big on that. He also built the Ulugh Bay Madrasa in Samarkand and Bukhara, transforming the cities into cultural centers of learning where maybe they had gone downhill a little while during this period and he kind of brought them back. And um, but he was also known as just a very uh, skilled politique politician. During his short reign, um, he failed to establish his power and authority, or he was known for not being politique, sorry. And he failed to establish his power and authority. And as a result, people assassinated him and overthrew him and took over the Timur dynasty from him, but he was known for being a great patron of the sciences. And another uh, Timur successor is Sultan Hussein Baikara Mirza, and he was considered the last uh, Timur ruler of any significance. And he was a skilled statesman. And he was really known for his interest in the arts as well. And, you know, paid for all kinds of different uh, research and learning in his kingdom. And during his time, it was known as the second Timurid Renaissance. And so he was described as the quintessential Timurid ruler of the later period in Transoxania. And his sophisticated court and generous artistic patronage was a source of admiration, particularly from his cousin, the Mughal Emperor Babur. And so both the Ilkhwanids and the Timurids, they, uh, their uh, political authority was intertwined with the fact that they were of Mongolic heritage. And the Mongolic political system or way of being a politician, the way of ruling was deeply ingrained in these sultanates or khanates or whatever you want to call them. And the Mongol imagery played a big part during this time. Um, the Mongols were known for uh, patronizing all different religions and different types of um, sciences so very much what um Ghazan and uh Hussein Beqara were doing was very much within the Mongol tradition of Mongol rulers elsewhere such as in China and over the Golden Horde um so the kind of the Mongolic way of ruling became the dominant way of ruling the Muslim world that the Ottomans Safavids and Mughals will later uh, take on. 
and the Mughals, they are a break off of the Timurids. And they chose the name Mongol, which is Persianized as Mughal. And they claimed that they were descendants of Genghis Khan and they invaded South Asia from their base in Central Asia, basically Samarkand and Bukhara. And later on, they uh, Hirat and different Kabul and different you know places in Afghanistan, and then they invaded um, basically uh, South Asia or the Indian Peninsula, whatever you want to call it. And they replaced the Delhi Sultanate and things like that. But Babur, which literally means tiger, he was the first Mughal emperor, and he was the cousin of of Hussein Baikara. And he was a descendant of Temur and Genghis Khan. And, um, you know, like how I mentioned with the Turks before, who always had this relationship with Persianate languages, um, the Temurids, Ilkhanids, and Mughals also had this kind of reverence for Persianate culture and kind of seen it as they had like this inferiority complex where they seen Persianate culture speaking Persian as better or superior than Turco Mongol culture to some uh, extent. And so that's why, you know, up until basically the time of the British, uh, Persian was still used as the court language for the Mughals. Um, and even now, if you study in the South Asian Madrasa system, the, the, Darsi Nizami curriculum, it's uh, usually going to have uh, Persian books and instruction of Persian is still part of that curricula. I've talked to graduates of that system who had to study Persian in order to learn books of Muntaq, logic, and, and other types of things. So it is still very much a part of Islamic culture, even now, this, this tradition. And so... Um, we're going to get into next week, you know, the Ottomans, uh, Mughals, and Safavids. The Safavids are very interesting. Um, they have very interesting origins. So after the decline of the Timurid Empire, um, Iran was kind of mod where modern day Iran is, was politically splintered. And there was all these kind of uh, religious movements that were trying to fill in the gap because the government had lost power and kind of these local religious authorities started to basically fill in the vacuum and become local, uh, local political leaders themselves um, to kind of keep order. And there was a lot of uh, Shi'i... Um, I guess Da'is or people proselytizing, lots of Shi'is were proselytizing during this time because there was no government authority to stop them. And so they saw this as a ripe time to spread their um, beliefs because no one would stop them. And Safavid history goes to this uh, Sufi order called the Safawiya. And and its eponymous founder was Sophia Din Ardebiri. And Sophi means the purifier. Um, and Sophawiya means like the purified ones. And so it was a Shi'i Sufi order. And its followers were called Qizlbash. And Qizlbash, it literally means red hats. And if you see in the picture here, it's referring to this cone style um, Persianate red hat that was made out of wool. Um, I'm not sure if it was that slender and long like in the picture, but you could see it nowadays with the um, Naqshbandiya Sufi order. If you type stuff about the Naqshbandiya Sufi order into YouTube, you'll see them wearing the cone hats, cone style kufis, right? And the reason that they're a cone is because they're meant to be worn with a turban. So they had these red cone style uh, tarbush or kufis with the turban. And um, most of them ethnically were Ogos, Turkic speaking clans. 
Some of them were Persians, of course, um, and their kind of base was in Azerbaijan, which was kind of further away from Timurid control. And the uh, Qizilbash, they were uh, basically like spiritual warriors. They were Sufi Mujahideen. Um, they carried swords and spears and, and sometimes pistols or rifles. Um, and they they had uh, intense loyalty um, to whoever was the leader of the tariqa, who they called the khalifa, the khalifa being the leader of a Sufi order. And so they called Shah Ismail the first as their khalifa. And um, he himself was mixed of ethnic origin, um, being Greek, Georgian, Kirk, Kurdish, and uh, Turkish. And um, he was a descendant of the, the founder, if you will, of the Sophia order, Sophia Dean. And um, he started conquering the per Persianate world and taking over most of Timurid territory. And he forcibly converted the Persian world to Shi'i Islam by the punishment of beheading. So if you did not convert to be a Shi'i, you would get your head chopped off. And um, before that, Iran remained a bastion of Sunni thought, as we learned with the Seljuks and the Madrasa Nizamiya, Imam Ghazali refuting the Ismailis and all these different things. Uh, most of the you know, Imams of Hadith, Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Hanifa, you know, these were all uh, Persian uh, people. Uh, you know, it's always been a bastion of, of Sunni thought, Fakhruddin al-Razi and the likes. Um, but that changed with the Safavids uh, conquering Persia. And to this day, the central uh, lands of Iran remain uh, Shi'i. But at the peripheries is where all the Sunnis live because the, the Safavid state couldn't enforce this uh, forced conversion upon them. And nowadays in the modern Iranian state, um, even after the Islamic Revolution in 1978-79, even after that, now there's there's a pretty good tolerance of the Sunnis that live in Iran. 30% of Iran is Sunni to this day, and they're allowed to have basically what amount to Islamic universities that teach Sunnism. Very big Sunni uh, madrasas that exist in the outskirts of Iran. Um, so it's not as intolerant as it's made to seem. Um, just keep that in mind. But definitely during Safavid rule, they were extremely intolerant to Sunnis. So that's something to keep in mind. And without further ado here, um, you can watch more from Professor Richard Bullitt talking about the world impact of the Mongols and how it goes just beyond the Islamic world. Although he is a specialist in Islamic history and he's a specialist in Iranian history. Um, his first book, The Patricians of Nishapur, is about the kind of clashing between Hanafi and Shafi'i families in, in Nisabur, the city of Nisabur or Nishapur in English. Um, and that was right before the Seljuks kind of came in. So, without further ado, I give you Richard Bullock. All right. Uh, we need to talk again about the things related to the chapter dealing with the Mongols in the East and the Mongols in the West. And for the last couple of days, I've entertained this thought and that thought and other thought and so forth and didn't come up with a whole lot. Um, maybe it's because the chapter was uh, was well written and wasn't all that more that needed to be said. Maybe it was because I didn't know enough about the subject, although I think I wrote the chapter. Um, I actually just rewrote Pamela Crosley's chapter. Um, there are certain things that uh, you look at it more broadly and you find somewhat curious, though it's a little hard to know what to make of it. For example, where the Mongols ruled directly, which would be 
outside of their home territories in Central Asia, uh, Iran and China, uh, the period of Mongol rule is a period of a pretty high cultural performance that has uh, comparatively little anti-Mongol uh, feeling or feeling by the Mongols against the indigenous populations. In the areas where they ruled um, as overlords, uh, which would be true of Korea and uh, Eastern Anatolia, uh, Russia, you have patterns of cooperation that are uh, roughly similar. And in some ways, the areas that, where they were, where they did not penetrate, are the areas where they seem to have had the, the almost mythic uh, impact that is attributed to them generally. Places like Lithuania, uh, Eastern Europe in general, uh, Mamluk, Egypt, and Japan, uh, suggesting that the, uh, that the perception of the Mongols as a, uh, as a, an, a force in history uh, is, like so many other things in history, uh, variable depending on where you're looking from. And without a, uh, a Mongol-authored, Mongol-central narrative, uh, you're almost always uh, confined to one of these external viewpoints. Having said that, yeah, well, what more is there to say about the Mongols? Um, uh, what I did last time was to talk about uh, non-Mongol things I wanted to talk about, namely the Mamluks and the changes that occurred in the Mamluk period, that is to say in the 13th century, beginning of the 14th century, that were not generated by the Mongols, but uh, developments that had, in a sense, been disguised by the fact that the, uh, that the historical uh, narrative is so heavily dominated by the fear of the Mongols. Uh, you might uh, say something similar about, uh, about Japan, where the fear of the Japanese, of the Japanese had of another Mongol invasion uh, played an important role in the shaping of the Japanese polity, and yet um, most of the things that uh, characterize uh, the later shogunate in uh, Japan as it emerges um, are not primarily or even in any substantial measure attributed to the Mongols. I would say there's no, uh, no cultural influence or anything like that. So with the Mongols, it depends a bit on what you see, depends on where you're looking from. And so what I'm going to talk about, instead of uh, going through a rundown of what these views might be, I'm going to talk about food. Uh, I've mentioned before in this class that food history is in a state of rapid uh, development. Uh, lots of historians are uh, focusing on the history of food, and it has the virtue of being something that can interest historians of every period, every part of the world, because uh, everybody eats. Uh, the degree to which the, uh, the subject is studyable by historians depends a lot on sources, but the nice thing about food is that the sources can be so diverse. Some of them will be narrative sources where you have descriptions of banquets or, uh, or kind of ethnographic uh, comments made uh, by writers. Some of them are archaeological where you actually find the remains of uh, meals or kitchens or um, garbage pits. Uh, some of them are visual. Uh, for example, when you read that the, uh, that the most important banquet foods in uh, 15th century or 16th century Europe uh, were, uh, uh, were birds and primarily uh, cranes and herons, uh, uh, you can go to uh, paintings of the 
a period of Rembrandt, of Rembrandt and see uh, paintings showing a whole parcel of upper class uh, Dutch members of some company at the dining table. And you look at what's on the dining table and you find they're mostly um, birds uh, with long curvy necks. And you say, ah, those are the cranes that they used to eat. But what I want to uh, focus on uh, does relate to the Mongol period in one sense. Um, in our chapter, we, we try to draw commonalities between uh, different societies in different parts of the world, some in the west, some in the east, that uh, change in response to the Mongol um, onslaught. And for the East Asia, we have a heading that says, you know, East Asia emerges, in which we sort of look at the 13th century and into the 14th century as a time when you get a, uh, a spreading and a more, uh, a broader generality of culture, particularly associated with the spread of Confucianism or in the Neo-Confucian form, which had nothing whatsoever to do with the Mongols. Um, but one of the things that doesn't really become so homogenized is food in East Asia. Uh, Mongol, Chinese, Korean, and Japanese cuisines uh, are uh, markedly distinct from each other. I would imagine the same is true if you get down into Vietnam, but I don't know enough about Vietnamese cooking in its earlier phases to comment on that. But what you have is a uh, persistence of diversity, uh, even as the, uh, the upper classes become more and more uh, oriented toward similar views, whether those are uh, rever reverence for the Confucian classics and uh, appraisal of the qualities of someone to hold uh, official office as dependent upon their mastery of the Confucian classics, or whether it is um, a homogeneity based on the spread of Buddhist views, um, particularly either in the Pure Land sect or in the Zen uh, form of Buddhism, Zen in Japan, Chan in China, and I don't remember the Korean word uh, for the equivalent. Uh, but at the level of food, um, they remain rather separate. Contrast that uh, with the West. Uh, a meal in uh, Baghdad or Rome or Paris uh, or uh, Copenhagen or Amsterdam, say, um, would be pretty much identifiably a meal, uh, regardless of uh, the language spoken or the uh, particular cultural characteristics of the society, whether they were Muslims or Christians or whether Eastern Christians or Latin Christians. Uh, there, there are significant variations. In an earlier chapter in the book, we spoke about a sort of Mediterranean uh, diet that emphasized uh, uh, olive oil and seafood um, uh, and uh, grain uh, versus a Germanic diet farther to the north that emphasized uh, dairy products, butter, uh, 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 meat and um, uh, beer instead of the wine that you would have in the south. And as you go over into the Middle East, you have uh, some more variations. But by and large, uh, the West has a fairly uniform notion of, of food. Uh, not surprisingly, given the way in which 
world history has been uh, slanted in the writing of it by Western historians, uh, a key part of it is uh, cereal, uh, cereal grains, and in particular wheat. Uh, the West loves its bread, and before uh, wheat was developed uh, enough to really produce bread well, they loved their porridge. You know, nothing like oatmeal to get you going in the morning or the afternoon or the evening or pretty much any time of day. Um, so you had boiled grain or uh, baked uh, bread, which could either be leavened or unleavened. Uh, you had a set of vegetables that you could put in that uh, boiled grain or eat along with the bread. And by and large, those vegetables are ones that we would, uh, that we would recognize now. Uh, there are some vegetables uh, that you had in uh, classical antiquity and into the Middle Ages that we don't eat so much now, but it's not, it's not extraordinarily different. Um, this is a uh, cookbook from Imperial Rome by uh, an author named uh, Epicius. Uh, it's the best known uh, Roman cookbook. It is uh, supposedly reflects the imperial um, taste in Rome. It's in 10 books, and uh, when you look at the, at the topics in the books, I'm, I'm certainly not going to go into uh, menus here uh, or recipes, uh, because this particular translation was done by people who were known to be good cooks, but not particularly good at Latin. Uh, therefore, it's, uh, they say it's an improvement because they can, you can use the recipes, but uh, there are perhaps some la lapses in the, uh, in the Latin side of it. So in book six, uh, devoted to fowl, uh, here are the chapters. Uh, ostrich, uh, chapter one, you have uh, boiled ostrich, ostrich stew, with boiled ostrich, it's good to have pepper, mint, cumin, leek, celery seed, dates, honey, vinegar, raisin wine, broth, a little oil. Boil this in the stock kettle. Uh, you know, put everything in the kitchen in the kettle with the ostrich and boil until tender. So you have ostrich. Chapter two is devoted to crane or duck, partridge, doves, wood pigeon, squab, and diverse birds. Chapter three is devoted to thrush. Uh, chapter four to the fig pepper, the fig pecker. I don't know what a fig pecker is. Um, chapter five to the peacock. Chapter six to the pheasant. Chapter seven to the goose. And chapter eight to the chicken. And of course, the striking thing here is that the chicken comes last, whereas uh, uh, we would probably assume that the chicken uh, would come first in most lists of fowl. Um, but there is a preference implied here for uh, wild birds uh, over domestic birds. So the, the goose and the chicken are at the bottom of the list. Peacock and pheasant that come just before them are uh, uh, domestic sort of, uh, in Roman times. And then above that, you have wild birds, uh, including duck, which uh, seems to hear the more important here is a wild bird. Uh, that's book six. Book seven, um, labeled uh, sumptuous dishes in this translation. Uh, it has 17 chapters. Um, the number one, the first one, is sow's womb, cracklings, bacon, tenderloin, tails, and feet. Um, and you think, well, that pretty much covers the pig. But no, because chapter two 
is sow's belly. Uh, chapter 3 is fig-fed pork. Then you have uh, chops and steaks, then roasts, then boiled and stewed meats, then paunch, then loins and kidneys. One suspects that the loins are actually the testicles. Uh, then pork shoulder, uh, livers and lungs, homemade sweets. I'm not quite sure whether that is sweetbreads or not. Uh, bulbs and, tuber and tubers, mushrooms, truffles, uh, snails, and eggs. All these in the, same, in the same book. Nothing wildly uh, ununderstandable, although I must say a few... Um, where does it is it in Valponi where uh, the guy talks about his feast of uh, the swelling, unctuous teat of a pregnant sow new cut off? And you think, what a disgusting uh, meal. But pregnant pigs were indeed a particular delicacy. Uh, and the unborn, uh, you know, suckling pig is good, but hey, unborn pig. Uh, that's going to be even more, more tender. So uh, the swelling, unctuous teat of the pregnant sow new cut off uh, was in fact a, a delicacy that um, charmed people. Uh, in book eight, you have quadrupeds. And here we have uh, wild boar, venison, uh, chamois and gazelle in the same chapter, wild sheep, beef and veal, kid and lamb, pig, hare, and dormouse. Um, again, the preference here is for the wild uh, animals, or at least they, they take precedence, uh, which I am understanding to be preference, over the, uh, over the domestic animals, so that wild boar is number one, whereas pig is number seven. And there is a great question whether in terms of cuisine, uh, whether people distinguished, uh, you know, how, what distinction people drew between boar and pig. Um, uh, I was in a restaurant in uh, Prague a number of years ago uh, that featured uh, various somewhat unusual meats. And the, on the menu, it had a dish called um, uh, wild boar Jewish style. <laughs> and I thought, gee, this sounds kind of strange. And um, so I asked our host, a very right-wing Catholic gentleman, whether he thought there was some sort of contradiction in having a pig served Jewish style. I think, in the back of my mind, I thought that he was going to say that this is the way Jews were served. But, um, uh, but he said, well, what's the problem? I said, well, boars are pigs, and Jews don't eat pigs. And... Um, so he had never heard of that odd <laughs> belief. So I ordered the dish, and then as I was eating it, he said, I see you ordered it, and you broke your law. I said, well, actually, I'm, I, I'm not Jewish. I just wanted to see what Jewish style meant. <laughs> and um, with onions. No. <laughs> I stewed up with onions. It was, it was pretty good, actually. Um, but... You know, this is Roman period, and as you go forward, uh, even though the, the sources become uh, less detailed for the West, uh, though we do have some very good uh, information on cooking in the Islamic caliphate, um, it, it's not, there's not, there are no big surprises. Uh, if there is a unified culture uh, in the sort of northwest quadrant of the Afro-Eurasian uh, landmass that encompasses Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa, 
uh, one of the ways of seeing that is to look at the, uh, at, at the uh, fairly common diet uh, throughout the area. Uh, there is nowhere near the difference among the different cuisines, whether we're talking about Persian or Turkish or uh, French or uh, <laughs> British, I suppose. Um, <laughs> if we can use the word cuisine there. Uh, uh, there is nowhere near the difference that you get among these various cuisines uh, compared to the difference you would get in East Asia um, among various uh, cuisines. Um, now, the reason I bring this up in this particular lecture is that uh, I want to talk a bit about a book that uh, is quoted in a rather brief section in the chapter that you are to have read for today. And this is book, a book uh, by um, Paul Buell and Eugene Anderson. It's entitled, A Soup for the Khan, spelled Q-A-N instead of the K-H-A-N that we're more familiar with. What it is, is a, um, a cookbook that was prepared for the descendants of Kublai Khan. Uh, Kublai Khan was the grandson of Genghis Khan. Uh, he was born in 1215 in the Mongolian steppe land. In other words, he sort of the last of his line of the family to actually grow up um, uh, in the Mongolian uh, homeland, in the Mongolian tradition. By 1274, um, the conquest of China that had been begun by Genghis Khan, um, and, uh, you know, in the same time frame of the first invasions in the Middle East in the second decade of the 13th century, by uh, 12, uh, 1274, China had really been uh, conquered by the Mongols, and the Chinese army, uh, the Mongol armies, had pushed on into Korea, uh, northern Vietnam, then called Annam, and uh, were poised to, uh, to invade Japan. Uh, the capital for the Mongols uh, was Beijing, uh, which uh, they, uh, you know, sort of the emergence of Beijing as it, it pre-exists, but as the main imperial capital of China, it really it comes into its own at this time. And there was a, um, a, a resort area known as Shangdu, which was northward uh, toward the uh, toward the steppe land, toward Mongolia, and that is uh, what becomes the uh, Xanadu in Coleridge's uh, in Coleridge's poem. Uh, the uh, the cookbook that we have uh, for the ruling family of the of the Khans. Uh, was written by a gentleman with a Chinese name, although it is assumed that he probably was not a uh, ethnically exclusively Chinese. It's assumed that he is probably by the editors of this and translators. It's assumed that he was a, uh, a mixed uh, parentage, uh, perhaps Chinese and Turkic of some sort, probably not a Mongol. The, uh, it's a very, a very extensive uh, text. This is a 700-page book. It has, um, uh, you know, it's woodblock prints. Uh, and probably, uh, well, it's certainly one of the most extensive cookbooks that we have from the medieval period. Uh, and what's extraordinary is that it is very specific to the Mongol ruling family. Uh, it reflects uh, from time to time uh, some influences from the Middle East, 
That is to say you have some, some food products that have Middle Eastern names or are reminiscent of Middle Eastern dishes. And it reflects uh, some of the um, tendencies, tendencies from China. So you have uh, some Chinese products and some uh, you know, Chinese medical views. But by and large, it appears to reflect the, uh, is, that, is somebody's telephone ringing? And now you stopped it. <laughs> um, so it reflects uh, a, a Chinese view, particularly on the medical side. Now, it is striking how different uh, the Mongol world was from the worlds of the people whom the Mongols uh, conquered. Uh, and this you know, shows up uh, very strikingly in the, uh, in, in the foods that they consumed. Mongolia, of course, uh, is primarily, down to the present day, a land of uh, pastoral herders. Um, there is only, uh, I think there's still only one American fast food restaurant in Ulaanbaatar, the capital, and that is uh, a branch of uh, BD's Mongolian Barbecue, um, which has a particular kind of cuisine where you grill meats that are skewered on a long sort of uh, sword-like thing on a, uh, on a propane heated griddle. And uh, BD's Mongolian Barbecue bears no relation to any known Mongolian practice. Uh, it is a uh, uh, a Japanese style of cooking that they decided to name, Mongoli, uh, name Mongolian for reasons I don't really know. But the, uh, the Mongols had a diet that was extremely heavy in, uh, in meat and animal products, uh, but not notably in the meat of the horses. Uh, horse was considered a delicacy. Occasionally you would eat horse uh, on a ceremonial occasion, but by and large horses were too valuable simply as wealth to, uh, to slaughter and eat. So the most common domestic animal uh, was the sheep uh, as a meat animal, uh, and pigs which would, of course, be extremely common in China, were, uh, were seldom eaten. Uh, they didn't have herds of pigs. But when you look at the list of animal foods contained in the book, uh, it is striking both for its variety and for uh, the difference between Mongolian notions of, uh, of meat eating and what you have elsewhere. Here's a list of the, of the meats, of the animal foods, the meats that were eaten. You can compare them with the, uh, what I said earlier about the, uh, uh, the examples from Rome. Sheep, no, ox, sheep, gazelle, the blue sheep, horse, wild horse, Elephant, camel, wild camel, bear, donkey, sika deer, red deer, river deer, dog, pig, wild boar, otter, tiger, leopard, pear David's beer, musk deer, muntjac deer, fox, rhinoceros, wolf, hare, uh, wild cat, tarbukan, uh, weasel, and monkey. There are recipes for uh, for all of these animals uh, in the book. And they're often very specific, like, um, oh, uh, wolf's head gruel, or, uh, you know, sheep brain puree, or things like that. I mean, it's, uh, every part of the animal uh, gets eaten. And when you look at the travelers who went to Mongolia, like Marco Polo, and talk about 
uh, they're eating, they, they stress the fact that, uh, that everything is eaten. Uh, you know, other than the dung, every part of the animal gets eaten, uh, and the bones are not given away to the dogs until they have been uh, drained of their marrow. And uh, the argument of these authors is that, uh, you know, this was not a food-rich country, and therefore you, you ate everything that you, uh, that you had. Now that's the, uh, the, the uh, mammals. Then we get to the poultry. You have swan, oriental swan goose, wild goose, crane, Eurasian curlew, chicken, pheasant, eared fowl, duck, wild duck, tufted duck, mandarin duck, pigeon, dove, great bustard, collared crow, common quail, sparrow, and bunting. Uh, sparrow and bunting. Uh, these are very small birds. Uh, and uh, they're, you know, I, I've seen in, um, you know, food markets in Southeast Asia, uh, birds this big that are, you know, fried up and made available. So, uh, but small birds were eaten earlier in Europe, though they're not mentioned in, in Apicius. Uh, they could eat, be caught in nets fairly easily and um, uh, you know, toasted up. For fish, this is an area that doesn't have many fish, and most of the fish mentioned here are uh, probably imported from China, although that doesn't make, uh, wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to actually bring them to Mongolia. They're more likely to be ones that came to uh, Beijing itself. Carp, golden carp, Chinese bream, white fish, yellow ship fish, green fish, sheet fish, sawfish, mud eel, bao yu, puffer, uh, skionoid fish, abar ku fish, good Persian name, uh, kilam fish, soft shelled turtle, crab, shrimp, sea, sh sea snail, trough shells, whey, freshwater mussels, and the prickly sculpin. Uh, this is an enormous variety of, of animal foods that, uh, that are listed in, in this book. Uh, I won't go on and read all of the fruits and all the vegetables or all the spices, uh, but what you have here is a variety in which uh, probably two-thirds or more of the items mentioned would be um, unfamiliar to uh, palates uh, at the western end of the Mongol uh, Empire. Uh, this despite the fact that you'd had, um, you know, uh, a thousand years, close to two thousand years of the Silk Road in exchange of products going across Eurasia. Uh, it, it just points out when you look at the uh, of these various products that everything does not, uh, does not travel. Uh, the author of the book was a specialist on, uh, on medicine, so he was particularly concerned with the medical um, indicators for each of these dishes. So uh, he has a list here of the the dispositions that would be cured by different uh, things. So donkey's head gruel, that cures apoplexy of vertigo, debility of hand and foot, annoying pain of extremities, and trouble in speaking. Yeah, well, are any of those diseases? You know, I have some problems with my hands and feet and trouble in speaking sometimes, and occasionally I guess an annoying pain in my extremities. I've had vertigo once. Maybe I should have donkey's head gruel. I mean, you know, it's it's interesting the degree to which the the medical section of the book is not oriented toward pathogens, but oriented toward indispositions, things that that we would not necessarily consider part of a medical uh, regime. That there, you know, 
there are states of the person that you might uh, want to correct in some fashion, but you wouldn't necessarily go to a physician uh, to do it. Uh, donkey, that was donkey's head gruel, but donkey's meat soup, it cures wind mania and depression and pacifies heart chi. Wind mania and depression. Uh, you have wind mania and depression? No. Is there a comma after wind? Or no, it, it, it's wind mania <laughs> uh, and, and depression. It's when the wind blows, you go, ah! <laughs> That's wind mania. And wind depression is when it blows you in the other direction, you say, oh, uh, t feel terrible. So then that's when you have donkey's meat soup. Uh, fox meat gruel. It cures infantile convulsion epilepsy, spiritual confusion, <laughs> indistinct speech, and inappropriate singing and laughing. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you get a singing or a laughing fit, you want to head right for the fox meat gruel. On the other hand, bear meat gruel cures the various winds, evil foot chi, numbness insensitivity, and five flaccidities, flaccidities tendon, the tendon and muscle spasms. Uh, since it's very hard to know what these indisp indispositions are, um, uh, without, you know, coming at it from the point of view of Chinese medicine. Uh, you don't know quite where to go with this, except that um, the, the, the foods themselves uh, are so uh, suggestive. Uh, kudzu starch gruel, uh, hemp seed congee, black donkey skin soup, uh, wild pig meat broth, uh, otter liver gruel, uh, now, then there's a section that tells you about the things that you cannot eat with each other, that just don't go well together. Um, if one has taken Chinese foxglove, one must not eat prepared stinking elm. Um, if one has taken false hellebore, one must not eat orangutan meat. Uh, which is not mentioned as one of the animals that the Mongols ate. And there are no orangutans anywhere remotely close to Mongolia. Uh, if one has taken China root, one must not eat vinegar. If one has taken Chinese asparagus, one must not eat carp. Um, uh, and there's a whole list of those. Then you have uh, stuff that appears to be extremely uh, practical. Um, benefits and harmfulness of foods. Uh, if flour has a stinking smell, it cannot be eaten. If fresh ingredients are discolored and stink, they cannot be eaten. If broth is old and food is watery, it cannot be eaten. If one boils meat and it does not change color, it cannot be eaten. If the various meats are not slaughtered, they should not be eaten. Now, that's a very curious one uh, because uh, it suggests that, that the method of slaughtering is, a, uh, is an important uh, factor. If the various meats smell and are spoiled, they cannot be eaten. The various brains cannot be eaten. Any sacrificial meat which moves on its own cannot be eaten. <laughs> yeah. Rule out all that wild? Well, so might that have to do with not eating carrion flesh? Oh, yes. Probably so. That probably is to keep away from carrion. Um, neither horse's liver nor cow's liver can be eaten. A hare with closed eyes cannot be eaten. Um, one cannot use mulberry wood fire for roasting meat. Uh, hare meat should not be eaten during the second month. Um, avoid storing various meat jerkies in rice. There is poison. Uh, 700 pages of this uh, pithy uh, advice on eating uh, designed to inform 
the court of the Mongols. What it, it is striking how little overlap you find in this between what's here and what is on the Chinese restaurant menu that you look at uh, when you're doing takeout ordering. Um, it's, it's, a different, it's a different world. And of course, the dairy products, which, are, which I haven't talked about here, are ones that are uh, comparatively uh, rare in Chinese cooking of that era. Uh, fermented mare's milk is uh, almost a staple for, uh, for the Mongols. Um, although they also had fermented other milk, they had fermented camel's milk as well. But fermented mare's milk, even though they didn't eat the horses, they would, um, particularly during the spring foaling season when they had a lot of milk, that was the preferred time to consume uh, fermented mare's milk. Um, there are a lot of beverages listed, but they are uh, not alcoholic beverages. Uh, they're you know, uh, herb teas of the most remarkable diversity and so forth and so on. Okay, so the Mongols um, rule a tremendous area that they have certain food practices and certain food preferences that don't appear to have had much impact uh, outside the Mongol society itself, although by Mongol here probably I should include uh, Central Asian Turkic because the distinction culturally between the Mongol tribes and the Turkish uh, peoples who became amalgamated into the Mongol army in the course of the conquest uh, is not a uh, uh, particularly profound distinction. Um, but it's, it, it's indicative of, of the fact that the, the, the Mongols, though they set up an enormous empire of great importance for world history, uh, did not um, create a cultural model. Um, if you look at, uh, at comparisons, um, you could say, well, did the Arabs set up a cultural model uh, from Morocco to um, Central Asia when they carried out the conquests that established Islam in that, in that region? If you went back to, a, uh, to an Arabian cookbook of the time of the prophet, uh, it's not clear that you would find a very direct connection with what comes after the empire is formed. In other words, the Arabs may have been like the Mongols. They may have eaten one way uh, when they were in Arabia and then taken on the food practices of the people they conquered as they spread. Uh, the problem with the uh, Islamic era cookbooks is that they represent the cuisine of the, uh, of the Abbasid Caliphate uh, and what we know about the food practices of the Arabs in Western Arabia at the time of the Prophet is much more limited and is uh, contained to a substantial degree in hadith. Questions of what did the Prophet uh, eat or what did he approve of eating or not eating. And yet even so, there is um, little indication that you had a uh, uh, a profound difference. I think you had a great increase in variety uh, as you spread out from Arabia. But um, uh, an Arab cuisine uh, may have had some sort of broader impact, qua Arab uh, cuisine, qua Arabian desert cuisine, uh, dates, for example. Um, did the Romans spread a cuisine? Um, or did Alexander the Great and the Greeks spread a cuisine? Uh, very hard to, to affirm that because these are empires that are expanding within uh, a uh, section of the world that already had had a great deal of interaction over long periods of time. 
so that products that were available uh, on, you know, in the Roman Empire or in the Alexandrian Empire were products that had become available through, uh, through commerce uh, long before that time. Um, uh, wine, for example. The spread of wine drinking is prior to the, uh, to the spread of the Greek culture or later the Roman. Uh, one exception might be the Roman uh, penchant for, for garum. Uh, which basically is um, spoiled fish sauce uh, made out of um, sort of rotting anchovies, uh, which is probably the closest thing to it is um, Worcestershire sauce, which is also made out of anchovies, um, which you don't want to know if you're someone who doesn't like anchovies on their pizza or anchovies on their Caesar salad. And then you read and you find that there are anchovies in the Worcestershire sauce. But the Worcestershire sauce tastes so good. But, um, but the Romans put garum on everything. It was the ketchup of the day. And they exported it. And garum uh, containers have been found all over the Mediterranean area. Um, and that was a Roman specialty. But it's one, it's one thing. Uh, so I would, uh, I would say that the, the, the uh, the, the question with the Mongols um, is that they, they conquered an area without leaving a profound trace on the area, even if they had a tremendous impact on its history. This has been examined in many other ways. For example, the, the uh, comparative uh, um, lack of Mongolian words that show up in uh, in languages, in areas that the Mongols ruled, uh, the comparative uh, absence of Mongolian names, or uh, either individual names or tribal names, in areas that the Mongols um, occupied and had under their control for a century or so, uh, the Mongol uh, you know, the Mongol foot landed heavily, but left very little footprint. Just thought of that. A nice image, you know. Foot landed heavily, but oh, well. um, uh, and and it it really sort of singles the Mongols out. Now let me turn to this issue of East Asia in particular, and the uh, and the fact that not just that the Mongols did not have a impact on uh, homogenizing the food culture of East Asia, but that the the spread of those things that did uh, transform, in some degree, the, uh, the political and intellectual and ideological worlds of East Asia, such as Neo-Confucianism and uh, Pure Land and Zen Buddhism, uh, that they did not uh, homogenize uh, the food regimes either, because uh, Japanese, Korean, and Chinese cuisine have remained um, uh, strikingly distinct, except for the common uh, consumption of rice. Not surprisingly, the you know the data we have on the spread of rice farming from southern China and Vietnam into uh, broader areas is often talked about by world historians as a, a major move, but in fact, in northern China, uh, other grains uh, were used more than rice. And um, in uh, Japan, used to, you had um, buckwheat being used extensively uh, in areas where rice did not grow. So rice has a certain geographical restriction uh, to it. But even the way rice is cooked will differ from place to place. So the Korean uh, cooking of rice in an iron pot will be different from the way it is cooked in, uh, in, in China, say. Uh, in Korean uh, cuisine, according to descriptions of uh, eating etiquette, 
uh, you do not pick up your rice bowl and hold it up to your face and eat from it. You leave it on the table and you eat from it that way, whereas the Chinese and the Japanese would both hold the rice bowl up. Um, a table setting in Korea would always include a spoon and chopsticks, uh, you know, silver chopsticks if you have a, uh, uh, an elegant banquet. But the information we have on seating at banquets uh, portrays the Korean model in a somewhat different uh, fashion than the Chinese model. Uh, this is something that I've never really seen written up on a comparative basis, is the, the, um, the organization of banquets. But it happens to be something for which a lot of information is available on a, uh, on a cross-cultural basis. Um, so for example, um, uh, one of the descriptions of a Mongol banquet in China uh, would say that you know, the, the great Han sits at a table that is higher than anybody else's table. And then below him, slightly below him, are uh, other members of his family. And then below them are, and pretty soon you figure, well, the great Han must be about 30 feet in the air because everybody is below everybody else until you finally get down below. And, but the point was that supposedly everybody could see the great Han and observe him at the banquet, including the 40,000 onlookers who were there just looking at the banquet. Um, you can get a contrast here with the, uh, say, the banqueting practices of Baghdad under the, uh, under the Abbasid Caliphate. Because there, the, uh, the caliph uh, was on one side of a curtain and you, nobody could see the caliph eat, but he could hear the conversation and uh, if he chose, contribute to it. But nobody got to see him eat. But then you had various rules of etiquette that we have details on. For example, uh, no one is supposed to eat very much because if you ate a great deal, it would indicate that you found the food more interesting than the presence of the caliph. So you're supposed to, to go to the banquet, look at the screen or the curtain behind which the caliph was presumed to be sitting, and simply play with your food because you were so in awe of the imperial presence. Unless, and here is an important exception that's listed in the, you know, the, the book we have on, on this etiquette, unless you were known for, to be a, a, a great pig, uh, if you were famous for overeating, then you were expected to, to go and make an absolute display of yourself by gobbling up everything around so that you would amuse the caliph. Now, how the caliph saw this, whether he's kind of peeking through a hole, I don't know. Um, but certainly the ranks of people, you know, who sits uh, where with respect to the presence of the, um, of the caliph, uh, you know, that will be spelled out uh, just as it is in these descriptions of, um, uh, of Mongol banqueting and descriptions that we have of Korean uh, banqueting. Uh, I never attended a banquet uh, with the Shah of Iran, but I had friends who did before the Iranian Revolution they said, and I did go to, to, you know, official banquets in Iran from time to time. And there the, the protocol was that uh, you stand around and talk for a long time. And then presently they open the doors and you're invited into long tables that have uh, myriad bowls and, and plates full of food on them. Uh, and there are no chairs and no tables and you grab the, as much food as you can, as quickly as you can. And uh, the tables are pretty much stripped of food in a matter of five minutes or so. And then you stand there and you eat your food and then you go directly home. It's the very last thing that happens uh, 
uh, on, on the occasion. Now, um, and very reminiscent of descriptions that you have of, uh, of uh, triumphs after a battle where all of the booty is laid out on a table and the soldiers are invited in to grab what they can. And you have this image of, you know, they fell on such and such like, like Turks falling on a table full of booty uh, because, you know, you can get some coins or a nice helmet or a sword or something like that. But friends of mine who went to the uh, to imperial banquets said that you had the same thing where you had a big table, long tables full of food, and then the Shah and the Empress were sitting a deux at a table on the far side of the room having a dinner. Uh, and you were you know, the, the audience, the, the, the banquet guests, were to grab their food and eat, and nobody was allowed to have their back to the royal couple. So you're standing there eating, and presume, I presume not eating too much, unless, of course, you're a pig, um, and you're observing the Shah and his, uh, and his uh, empress uh, dining presumably on good Parisian cuisine, which was the taste of the Pathavi family. Um, and it, it's just striking how little change there was from what you find described in etiquette books of the, uh, of the ninth century. And on the whole, when you get into food history, uh, one of the things that, uh, that sometimes uh, strikes you is how persistent uh, foodways are and how um, uh, reluctant people are to give up their, their food habits. Some of the more variable uh, practices are those that you find in, in Western Europe. And I think that's not, not in terms of the, uh, of the foods that are eaten, but in terms of the eating style. I think that's partly because uh, the Western Europeans were barbarians and you know, ate in you know, crude and unseemly fashion and gradually developed uh, better manners. But older societies that had uh, ideas of etiquette, ideas of, of um, how to carry out a, a banquet uh, were um, uh, had much greater stability in the uh, in, in the um, in the foodway department in Korea, uh, Korea is not the only um, part of East Asia that uh, relishes eating dogs, but Korea has developed dog eating to a, a more refined level. Um, uh, dogs are eaten, particularly in southern China. Uh, in Taiwan, it's called fragrant meat. Um, but in Korea, you have special restaurants set aside for the serving of dog. Uh, a special breed of dog is, is raised as a meat animal and is completely distinct from, the, uh, from dogs that are uh, raised uh, as pets and are esteemed as pets. Um, Dog eating is primarily a summer, uh, you know, dish because it was felt to balance the, um, you know, the seasonal uh, effects of the summer. It was very important in uh, in humoral medicine where you you eat things that are supposed to compensate for changes uh, in the um, in the weather or uh, in your own uh, bodily balance. So if you had hot and cold, uh, uh, wet and dry, then if you, were, if you were in a very dry state, you would want to eat wet foods. And if you were in a hot state, you'd want to eat cold foods. And this becomes fairly, uh, you know, Fairly well entrenched in the um, uh, in the in the foodway traditions. Uh, uh, in Iran, for example, you can look at cookbooks 
that will say that you, um, uh, or say if you make a dish like uh, fesenjan, which is, well, it's just wonderful. It's a stew made up of um, uh, pomegranate syrup, uh, uh, ground walnuts, uh, onion, and, and what we would call chicken. Uh, the proper recipe calls for rooster uh, because this is a, uh, a warming dish that is meant to be eaten uh, in the winter when you're balancing the cold of the atmosphere. And a, uh, a rooster is, you know, the meat of a rooster produces a, uh, a warm effect on the humor, whereas the meat of a hen produces a cooling effect. Um, uh, you know, it's where these customs come from, it, it's hard to say. And I'm not always sure quite what the implication is, though I do recall vividly uh, traveling one night from Nishapur to Sabzavar in order to spend the night with some Peace Corps friends because there was a military group that had a movie and we would get to see a movie and sleep on the floor. And it was worth traveling uh, 100 kilometers in the middle of the night to see. And on the way, our driver stopped at a dark uh, adobe hut beside the road where he apparently customarily stopped in order to drink a great quantity of vodka, um, which he proceeded to do. But there was a marvelous woman there who, you know, a great florid woman of hard to describe her. But the man had ordered rooster and she took the rooster's head and sort of pulling her, her hijab partially over her mouth, she would nibble on the on the crest on the on the rooster's head with tiny little bites or and it was I'm sure intended to be something really, really, really sexy. Um, but, and, but the idea of eating the rooster's head as a heating thing, you know, I'm ready to eat the rooster's head and, you know, what's your word for rooster in English? <laughs> um, I don't know. It's a, uh, uh, when you run into something like that, you're, you're struck by the, um, uh, by, both the persistence of food ways, but also the impenetrability of, uh, of some of them. Uh, so I'm, I'm told that, in, that dog eating is a very special thing in Korea. There was a great debate at the time of the uh, World Cup in Seoul whether they should suspend dog eating in order not to offend people. And other people said, well, the Americans don't give up eating beef when the Indians come uh, for you know, the Olympics. So why should we give up eating dog? Then you get to Japan, where you have a totally different cuisine in which there, uh, you know, anything that lives in the ocean is eaten, uh, but very few land animals uh, are eaten. And you don't have herd animals. You don't have, uh, by and large, you don't have traditionally the eating of uh, lamb or, uh, uh, or pork or um, uh, you have some beef eaten, but usually superannuated plow animals rather than animals that have been raised for this purpose. Now all of this has changed, and the um, if there is one world empire that is changing the food ways uh, of the world, it's the United States. Um, and one of the things of the last, let's say, post World War II era has been the, the phenomenal um, shrinkage of the variety of foodways uh, in the world as uh, economic uh, and sort of pseudo-scientific or health-related issues have pushed everybody toward eating uh, beef so that the Japanese and the Koreans now eat uh, enormous amounts of beef whereas before they ate none to speak of, uh, pushed them to consume uh, milk and milk products. <coughs> 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 
push them to consume more wheat. And basically, there's a, <coughs> uh, a Western diet, essentially an American diet, that is um, taking over the world um, in a very striking way, particularly when you compare it with uh, earlier episodes of uh, <coughs> imperial expansion, whether economic or political. So the British did not spread their diet, thank fortune, around the world. <laughs> the French did not spread theirs. Uh, and certainly many parts of the world are still holding out against the globalization that we are currently experiencing based on sort of American practices. But it is a, um, uh, a daunting phenomenon and one that I think uh, makes it all the more important for us to, uh, to study the history of food, uh, the history of etiquette, the history of um, banqueting and things of this sort in order to see what they can tell us about, uh, about uh, you know, what, what really changes in the world and how those changes come about. Uh, a number of years ago, I, I was uh, asked by a librarian at the law school to come over and take a look at several large boxes of books in Arabic that they wanted to dispose of. And I certainly was in no position to go through you know, five or six large boxes of Arabic books and tell them what was, uh, what was important. They appeared to be primarily books of um, <clears throat> um, basically law books from various Arab countries that they no longer wanted. But somehow my uh, eyes lit upon uh, a book entitled Etiquette. Um, uh, that was the, it had the title on the cover in French. Uh, and in Arabic, it had it, uh, a much more elaborate title. And I plucked it out, and I said, well, this looks interesting. The, the book um, was published in 1898, I believe, uh, not in Cairo, but in Halwan, which was a, uh, a spa that wealthy Kyrenes and foreigners would go to to take the waters. It's now been spoiled by a steel mill. Uh, and it was a very, very interesting book on etiquette by an Arab writer who, well, by an Egyptian writer. He was probably Albanian by family background. Um, but it was an Egyptian writer who was uh, trying to uh, explain uh, to Egyptians uh, how Westerners live. And it was a very interesting uh, introduction to, to the book. He said, these people have come to our land <coughs> and observed us and studied us. They know how we get married. They know how we do circumcision ceremonies. They know, they know more about what we do than we do. And we don't know anything about them. Um, however, they have no respect for us uh, because we do these funny things. That is to say, we are objects of anthropological observation. Uh, we dress in peculiar and um, you know, unacceptable ways and so forth and so on. And therefore, if you want to be taken seriously by the Europeans, you have to study them as closely as they study you. You have to learn their, their, uh, their customs, their foods, their banqueting practices, uh, all of the uh, aspects of etiquette and daily life that they have studied with regard to you, you have to learn so that you can act like them because only then will they respect you. Yeah, you, you cannot wear a keffiyeh and expect anyone to, to respect you. You have to look like uh, 
a European, but beyond looking like a European, you have to know how to act like one. And it proceeds over several hundred pages to describe exactly how uh, Europeans behave, clearly based upon, um, upon close observation. So there's a chapter on the dinner party. What happens at, quote, the dinner party? It says, well, you know, initially uh, there are beverages and people, uh, people talk about this and that. Then they sit down at a table and the food is served and everyone falls silent. And then as they, have, as they reach the point where they have satisfied their appetite, conversation resumes. But now, instead of being dis dispersed, it's now centered around the table and everyone participates in the same conversation until they rise from table. Um, you know, there's more detail than that, but it, it accurately describes a dinner party in my apartment. Um, and, uh, and yet utterly different from everyone sitting on the floor around a tablecloth that's covered with food and you, as soon as you finish you get up and you, and you go somewhere else and wash your hands. I mean, utterly different from a traditional Arab uh, way of, um, of consuming a meal. There's a chapter, a brief chapter on the honeymoon. You know, what Europeans do after they, uh, the marriage and the, and, and the honeymoon because, you know, the Europeans describe the Egyptian marriages, so now we describe the, uh, you know, how to ride in a carriage. Say, you know, do not put your arm on the back of the seat if you're next to a woman. Because even though you think it's on the back of the seat, she won't think it's on the back of the seat, that sort of thing. Um, uh, and the heart of the book uh, is recipes. It's, it's a description of foods so that you know what the Europeans eat. And striking in this uh, list of uh, foods and recipes um, are little um, tipped in uh, illustrations that show you how to carve every, every food. Uh, that they must come from a previously published work, uh, probably French. You know, like how do you carve a rabbit? How do you carve this and that? And um, it's, a book, it's, it's a book that I found particularly interesting for the reasons that I've talked about in, in this lecture. But uh, then when I brought it to the attention of, of various uh, Arab friends, I found that they were extremely offended by the book. And I thought, nobody should know about this book. This book should disappear. Uh, it should never have been written because it says that we should be like Europeans and we are Arabs. We are completely different from Europeans. We, however, do buy our suits uh, from very good London suit makers. We do go to upper class schools. We do go to dinner parties, but we go as Arabs in this special Arab way. And uh, it, it just sort of, um, sharpened in my mind this, this degree to which etiquette and food uh, provide a lens for looking at cultural interaction, looking at the impact of empire, uh, looking at the persistence and reassertion of diversity under changing political and intellectual influences, and um, all this adds up to a um, to a peon in favor of, of food history and etiquette history and banqueting history. <laughs>